What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Tattoo Historians Digital Conference. So glad that so many of you are involved in the comment section, sharing, tagging, doing all that good stuff. It's been a great day so far. We've had some great presentations, and we're getting ready for yet another great presentation, which is a little bit more in my wheelhouse because we're going to be talking First World War history. And uh, I'm really happy to have Megan Clevenger on with us today. Uh, Megan will be presenting Saving Face, Art, Medicine, and Expectations of the Mutilated Face. Megan's topic focuses on facial mutilation in World War I and its impacts on masculinity and post-war collective memorialization. <laughs> I knew, Megan. I knew I was going to mess that up. <laughs> Megan is a public history graduate student at Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. You can find out more about Megan on her website, MeganClevenger.com, and I will be uh, pinning that in the comment section. So, Megan, how are you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you, too. I'm doing well. Um, yeah. hope everyone else is doing well, too. Yes, you had to throw memorialization in there. I did, and last minute. <laughs> I know. I, I, I apologize to everyone who's been looking at the uh, the post itself, I put demoralization uh, because I, I guess I was thinking if I had a mutilated face, I'd feel demoralized. It should have been memorialization uh, and I will change that as quickly as I can. <laughs> but uh, Megan, thank you again for being on. I will grab your uh, screen share and yep. then you can begin. Awesome. Cool, looks like I'm all ready to go there. Well, hello uh, everyone, thanks for swinging by good old Facebook to learn a little bit about some sad history here. Um, my mom always asks why I only study sad things and I find that they're the most interesting and usually have a positive outcome at the end. So I'm presenting my research today on um, facial, mutilation, facial mutilization during first, the First World War. There's a lot of big words, so forgive me if <laughs> I stumble over them a couple times. Um, so the title of this presentation is Saving Face, Art, Medicine, and Expectations of the Mutilated Face. Um, and I'm just gonna introduce it really quickly and then kind of move into my three M's of the paper. Um, and then I have a selected bibliography at the end. And if you want more information on my sources and or the whole very overwhelming list, um, please reach out to John or myself and we can get that to you. And then just kind of let you know where you can find me on the interwebs. So let's get started. Um, so faces are really important. Um, they really connect us not only to our personal identity and to our kind of personal humanity, but they also connect us to society at large. Um, it's how we emote, it's how we kind of show expression and show excitement or different emotions. And they provide a lot of like conversation triggers and things like that. So especially during World War I, when you, if you were a soldier who lost a part of your face, um, due to the war, you were losing a lot more than just kind of the physical aspects of losing a face. You were losing part of your identity, a part of your humanity, a part of a way to connect with the world around you. Um, so this presentation looks at the facial mutilization of soldiers in World War I and how it led to the intersection of art and medicine. And through advancements in reconstructive surgery and the production of portrait masks. Um, but then on the flip side of that, how these advancements in reconstructive surgery and portrait mask creation preserved masculine social standards at the time and also impacted post-war collective memorialization. Like I said, lots of big words. I hope I sound smart. Um, and I also wanna warn everyone who's watching that some of the images in this presentation are um, graphic, and I can try to remember to warn you when graphic images are coming up, but we are dealing with a really horrific injury here. So just kind of wanted to put that out there <laughs> that some of these images may be a little disturbing. So, oh, why did it do that? <laughs> I knew it wouldn't work when I wanted it to. We'll just go all the way back. Now you get to see it backwards before you get to see it forward. <laughs> uh, technology is great until it doesn't work. 
Great. So let's talk about, <laughs> sorry about that. Let's talk about mutilation first. So why was facial mutilation something that happened in World War I, but it's not something that we necessarily hear about in previous conflicts like the Napoleonic Wars or things like that. So there are actually two really big advancements at the time of World War I that lead us to this uptick in extensive facial trauma. Um, the first one is actually the introduction of the steel helmet to a soldier's uniform. Previous to this, there was no real protection for the head or face of soldiers. So if they were injured, um, in their head or in their face. Typically, they were killed <laughs> instead of maimed. Um, but with the introduction of the steel helmet, you're providing substantial protection to the super important parts of your head, like the brain and the back of your neck, but your face is still very exposed. And with that exposure came an increase in facial mutilation that didn't kill, but left horrific trauma on those faces of soldiers. Our next um, kind of move towards progress and why facial mutilation was such a big thing in World War I is advancements in artillery. Um, human progress often leads to um, better human destruction and artillery in World War I is a perfect example of that. It was definitely designed to cause as much human carnage as possible filled with shrapnel and that shrapnel also often tore through the exposed faces of men in the trenches or no man's land or wherever they were facing this kind of new and improved artillery and weaponry. Um, and then another reason <laughs> facial trauma maybe got a little bit of an uptick is that um, trench life in the First World War was exceptionally boring and I guess to liven things up some of the soldiers um, the young ones especially would poke their heads above the trench line to see if they could dodge the bullet from the other side of no man's land um it was often unsuccessful <laughs> they didn't dodge the bullet fast enough uh, often and that also led to <laughs> facial mutilation as well um that just seems like such a boy thing to me so with these reasons that facial mutilation um, had such an uptick in World War I, and this is kind of our first set of rather graphic images, so here we go in advance, the consequences became horrific facial mutilations from this advancement in shrapnel, from the protection of the brain and the back of the neck through advancements in the soldier's uniform. And these poor soldiers were left with gaping holes in their faces, scars that made them unrecognizable, and injuries that just really pulled away at their humanity. So we had to come up with a solution. There was an urgent need for faces to be fixed. So this is where we get to our intersection of art and medicine. And we have three major characters in this intersection. So I just wanna give a quick bio, a bio biographical look at these three characters and their impact um, on this intersection of art and medicine and helping these soldiers with facial mutilation just regain their identity and humanity. So our first kind of highlighted figure here is Major Harold Gillies. Um, he was an ear, nose, and throat specialist originally, actually from New Zealand, who moved to England um, at the onset of the First World War to offer his services. Um, he pioneered facial reconstructive surgery on a multitude of very willing patients um, with the influx of facial mutilation, facial mutilation because of the war. Um, he shared his discoveries across Europe. He was not the only surgeon doing this kind of work, but he was definitely the most high profile surgeon in the Entente powers doing this kind of work. Um, he recognized that facial injuries had a much higher success of being treated appropriately and successfully if there was treatment available right on site. So he began to demand, particularly for British um, operations, that field hospitals be equipped with facial trauma teams at the site so that by the time these soldiers got to him, they weren't beyond help with infection or additional injuries or dead skin all around the trauma. Um, 
He actually had his own facial trauma unit at Queen Mary's Hospital in London, where he did all of his work. So one of his most, and again, some graphic images here. One of his most pioneering works was, no, wrong way. I promise I know how to present. <laughs> one of his most pioneering works was the tubed pedicle, which was a way to keep blood flow to skin grafts onto an injured face. So Gillies discovered that one of the reasons that skin grafts didn't adhere appropriately to injuries was that they were the skin was essentially dying because of a lack of blood flow and then would be rejected by the placement site. So by building these tubes of skin on people's towards people's injuries and towards their grafts, he was able to ensure blood flow to this new skin and the success rate of the skin graft taking was exponentially higher than if they just put the graft on top of the injury and waited it out. So, so this was a major, major improvement and not only facial reconstructive surgery, but also in other major trauma such as burns and um, compound fractures and things like that, that perhaps needed covering from skin grafts. And oftentimes his surgeries were very successful and the scarring and the injury were well hidden through Gilly's work and Gilly's work in facial reconstruction. Um, but sometimes they weren't because this was such a new field and there was so much pioneering happening and so much of it was experimental. Sometimes the facial injuries were too traumatic for Gillies to fix or the surgery actually made it worse. So this is where the artists come into play and contribute their skills to helping soldiers regain their identity from their facial mutilation. And the first one we're talking about is Francis Derwent Wood. He um, was a British artist by trade. Um, by the time World War I rolled around, he was too old. He really wanted to enlist, but he was too old to enlist. So instead he volunteered as an orderly um, with the Royal Medical Corps and actually ended up volunteering at Queen Mary's Hospital, which he, at that place, he ran into Dr. Gillies. Um, what really got Gilly's attention about Wood is that for his patients, Wood would make these really injury-specific casts, plasters, splints, or other protections that were more designed for the patient's injury instead of kind of mass production, um, like was typically provided. And this was noticed immediately by Gillies, who kind of saw a need for this kind of work, but specifically for the patients he was working with, with facial trauma. So Gillies asked him if he would be interested in making these portrait masks for soldiers who were beyond Gillies' help or the surgery didn't help at all, and Wood agreed. So in 1915 at Queen Mary's Hospital, Wood opened up um, the masks for facial disfigurements department, which affectionately became known as the tin nose shop by the soldiers who were sent there. Um, so Gillies produced almost 200 of these masks over a period of four years. Um, they were a lightweight copper and painted to match the wearer's skin tones, hopefully blend seamlessly into their face, but only to hide the injury. They were meant to only cover the injury or the trauma and not cover the entire face of the wearer. Um, another uh, kind of step in this process was that he took really intimate and detailed plaster casts of these soldiers and their injuries and first formed these lightweight copper masks around those plaster casts so that he knew the mask was guaranteed to fit on these soldiers' faces. And he also, if the soldier had them, referenced pre-war photographs to make sure that the mask matched as closely as possible to what the soldier looked like before his injury. And then again, warning, a little bit of a graphic image coming up. But this is an example from the Imperial War Museum's photograph collection of a soldier who benefited from one of Gilly's, or not Gilly's, sorry, one of Wood's masks. As you can see, there's a very obvious um, facial trauma on the first image there, but with the help of one of Wood's portrait masks from a distance and a blurry photograph, you can barely tell that this young man was injured and the severity of his injury. And that has a massive impact on the mental health and kind of societal integration of these soldiers. The last artist who was doing this kind of work was an American sculptor named Anna Coleman Ladd. Um, she 
She actually moved to Paris with her husband when he was assigned to oversee a displaced children's camp in France. Um, she in America was known as a mediocre sculptor at best at the time. Um, she was aware of Wood's work in England. In fact, a colleague of hers right before she moved had sent her a telegram saying that her, her talents would be just so needed in France because of the amount of mutilés, which is what they were called in France, the French word for it, which I'm sure I'm butchering. Um, there was just a massive need for this kind of portrait mask work that was being done in England that Ladd could make a, a huge impact on the men if she um, was able to do it. So she agreed to do that and partnering with the American Red Cross opened her portrait mask studio in Paris in November 1917. Um, over the course of about a year and a half, she worked with 92 French mutilés and four American soldiers with facial trauma to produce these really personalized portrait masks. Lad's work is a little more um, personalized and her craft craftsmanship is more detailed than Wood's work was, but Wood was also really pushing these masks out very fast. The process was very similar though. And with the plaster casts, taken of these mutilated faces, the lightweight copper mask being fitted perfectly to the injury and painted um, to match the skin tone using pre-war photographs to really capture the personality of these soldiers and what they were missing on their faces. Um, she also went the extra mile though and added additional uh, personalized details. She would add wired mustaches and facial hair to the masks to make them look more like themselves. Um, she would paint eyeballs the match perfectly the color of the eyes to make sure that the soldiers looked the most like themselves or their pre-war selves. And one of the things I find most amusing is that in one of her masks, at least one of them that we have photographic evidence for, she put a hole in the mouth so that the wearer could still smoke. And sorry, didn't warn you about the graphic image before, but this is a before and after of one of the soldiers that Ladd specifically helped, um, courtesy of the Smith uh, Smithsonian American Art Archives. Um, as you can see, again, from a distance, you can hardly tell that he's wearing a mask. The mask is held on by his glasses, and they are um, really just a personalized work of art that helped cover the injury. And I just love this photograph. This was also so in Ladd's archives of a soldier named Charles Victor, a French soldier that she painted a mask for. And he sent her a photo of him wearing his mask out and about. And with the accompanying letter was just very proud that no one knew that he was a mutile and his wife and children weren't scared of him any longer, which is heartbreaking as that is, just shows the immediate and positive impact that Ladd and Wood and Gillies had on the lives of these soldiers with facial trauma. But at the same time, while improving the lives of these soldiers, they also upheld standards of masculinity of the time period. So at this, by the onset of World War I, these gender social roles and kind of performative gender expectations were really solidly set in stone. There was a masculine sphere where men were allowed or were expected to kind of have this very public role um, whether it was through work or politics and especially sports, sports and masculinity and military were connected um, across the board. Men at this point in time, and this is definitely played on in a lot of the recruitment advertisements, are meant to be this athletic, stoic, courageous person, the breadwinner of the family and the protector of the women and children of their countries. And we can see this in the recruitment advertisement. We have this very courageous masculine British man storming forward on his equally muscular and courageous horse, um, ready to take on the enemy. This Australian recruitment portrait shows this connection between um, masculine expectations of sport participation and the connection to militarization and kind of the militarization, militarization of sports and how they were really looking for these men who played these public uh, masculine roles to enlist. And finally, as the protector and breadwinner of these families, men 
were expected to go to war to protect their women and their children and make sure that no harm came to them. So how do facial injuries specifically then impact wartime and post-war masculinity? Well, I kind of have it broken down into three subjects. So our first one is economic. Right off the bat, facial injuries, and you were right, John, they were demoralizing. Um, we're seen as demoralizing. Um, specifically in terms of returning to the war front. Um, so, <laughs> fun fact, at least in Britain, if you received uh, facial mutilation, you were not returned to the front because it was going to be demoralizing to the troops who are still there, and you actually got your full post-war pension, which was way more than if you only lost an arm or a leg or an eye or something inconsequential like that. Um, so they weren't able to economically participate in the war as soldiers because their injuries were demoralizing. Another reason they were often unable to find jobs is that at the time, facial deformation was heavily associated with the sexually transmitted disease syphilis. One of the more physical side effects of that disease is the nose rots away. And so these men were initially, because facial mutilation was a new consequence, of war. These men were initially associated with kind of sexual promiscuity and wantonness and workers and other people in society really didn't want, or employers and other peoples in society didn't really want to associate um, with these men. In addition, there was no prosthetic that would really assist these men in a work environment. While the masks covered the scarring and the trauma, they didn't provide an actual new eye for the soldier to be able to appropriately see the work that he was doing in a factory setting or something like that. Um, and though if you lost an arm or a leg or a finger or something, there were like prosthetics that you could specifically create or, or have made that would assist you in your specific job role. So that wasn't available um, for facial trauma soldiers, but the portrait mask and especially the plastic surgery helped the soldiers overcome some of these obstacles. In their personal life, if they had facial trauma, these soldiers were unable to kind of meet that expectation of starting a family or finding a fiance or something to that effect because their trauma really made them undesirable. And if they were married, there were definite concerns of attraction. Would they be able to procreate? Would they be able to have that family as was expected of men, and then work for and protect that family. Children were often afraid of their fathers. They were kind of, if they returned from the front with a facial mutilation, they were often seen as kind of the monster under the bed. And that was one of the things that the masks and, and surgeries helped with most, was really reintegrating the facially traumatized soldier back with their family. Um, if the man was unable to find work for the reasons I just listed, women were then forced to work outside the home, which looked bad on the man. It looked like he was unable to provide for his family, unable to find a job, couldn't find a job, wouldn't find a job, and just really emasculated him in a lot of ways. And again, like we talked about at the beginning, that loss of identity and humanity was a major blow to the mental health and psychological health of these soldiers. And finally, just kind of reintegrating into society there was something these soldiers kind of collectively called the Medusa effect, where if they went outside with just their faces showing, um, women would like scream and swoon in the street and people would stare and point and whisper. And it just made them feel really unwelcomed in to really unwelcomed in society and really halted the reintegration process. And just meeting the general expected aesthetics of masculinity. These soldiers were typically young. They had their whole lives ahead of them, and then they had to go to war. They gave the best years of their lives to this war and were injured beyond recognition. They were then unable to kind of meet that aesthetic of masculinity to find a spouse, create a family, find a job. It's all kind of a domino effect. And finally, society was really rather unsympathetic towards the plight of these soldiers. And this kind of became more of a problem towards the late 1920s and early 1930s when the world was plunged into a global depression. As these soldiers still received their pensions, the general public was upset because, you know, they, you know, they thought they deserved some of the welfare that these social 
that these soldiers were getting, and they were really unsympathetic towards the trauma and the experience of these soldiers in the wartime. So finally, we want to talk a little bit about memory, bring in some Paul Fussell and some Jay Winter here, everyone's favorite Great War uh, memorialization writers. So the memorialization of the war really left behind the dismembered, disabled, and the mutilated. When we look at wartime memorials, we're looking at soldiers or examples of soldiers or examples of men that are whole, both physical and psychological. And that is not how soldiers returned from the war. They returned from the war broken, mentally, um, disabled, physically. And when we look at these wartime memorializations, we look and see what type of soldier is really remembered, and especially with this one, and what type of soldier is kind of emasculated because of their inability to participate in the war anymore. We just see over and over again these motifs and th themes of this strong, whole man um, who kind of led the charge to victory against the Axis powers, and that is just not who the majority of the veterans of this war were. And something that I find super fascinating is even Francis Wood and Anna Coleman Ladd, when they were commissioned to create memorials to the war, despite working with these soldiers who were facially mutilated, in their memorials, they had these whole soldiers, no limbs missing, no real expression, though this one has some expression of grief from a lad. This is a sculptor, a post-war sculptor that Lad created. But it, I find it really fascinating that even though they worked directly with these soldiers in their memorialization of the war, both Francis Derwent Wood and Anna Coleman Ladd still held to the traditional tropes of the heroic soldier returning from a victorious war. But there is something being done about the memorialization, actually and I wrote this conference paper in spring of 2019, but in the fall of 2019, um, British historian Ellie Grisby actually commissioned and produced a sculpture um, to kind of, and it's pictured here, to represent the, and memorialize the facially mutilated soldiers of the war. And it was unveiled at Queen Mary's Hospital where um, Harold Gillies and Francis Wood did a lot of their reconstruction and portrait mask work. So here is my selected bibliography. I know that it's very small, um, but you're interested in finding out more about the sources I use and where to gather them. I have all that information available. And this is how you find me. Um, I have my own website, which John said he would ping. I'm also on LinkedIn. I love engaging with people on Twitter. And if you have any other questions, shoot me an email. I am so excited and so passionate about this research and work that I am excited to share it with you all. So thank you so much for listening to my talk and I'd love to field some questions and just talk more about this subject. Um, as morbid as it sounds, I really think it's an important social and cultural military history look at uh, World War I and, and, and Europe especially. That is very fascinating, Megan, especially for me seeing uh, <laughs> the, the post-war historical memory in, in monuments and it's so it's so interesting that these uh, these people worked with these men and knew uh, how they came out of this war, and yet the the personification of the veteran or of the soldier at the time is still glory. But now a new generation of historians, let's say, or people mm -hmm. who just love history in general, are showcasing that historical memory changes over time. Yeah. And that's really an interesting thing with that statue. I didn't know about that that statue. So that's awesome. <laughs> not to say I'm a procrastinator, but I didn't know about it until last night either. <laughs> oh, okay. That's not just me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it was actually just revealed in November of 2019. So it's, oh, wow. it's new. And um, this historian, she did her, she's currently in her PhD program, but she did her master's thesis on a specific mm -hmm. memorialization of dismembered um the mutilated soldiers. Wow, that's awesome. We have a we have a chance for a, a couple questions here. I want to bring Kara's on. Uh, do any of these portrait masks still exist? Sure. So that's actually a really interesting question. In my research, I found one in an archive, um, the Royal Surgeons Collection in the UK. 
Um, but for the most part, soldiers literally wore these masks to death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They wore them every day, every activity. Some even slept in them. They did not want people to know that they had the facial mutilization. There's evidence of several French soldiers actually being buried in their masks. So as far as I can tell, there is only one that is available to look at, at least in, in, a, in a museum collection. Wow. Um, and that kind of has a lot of consequences for the impact of masculinity too, where as these soldiers age, the certain part of their face is still reflecting 18, 20, 24 year old them but still found it important enough to wear and cover um, the mutilization. That's, that answers the second question because <laughs> Shelly had actually asked, did the men remove the masks each night? And obviously that's a personal uh, right. thing for each person, but apparently, as you say, some of them may not have. They may have just kept it on forever. Yeah, it was, like you said, a really personal decision and it was just kind of to keep the world out and keep that kind of image of them as a whole man. Mm -hmm. And to cover pain and trauma. Yeah, and trauma, yeah. Yeah. that I never thought of it that way, that I always saw it as like the the character on Boardwalk Empire. Who, yeah. You know, <laughs> who, and it, 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 that's the way popular culture has been introduced mm -hmm. possibly to this in some ways. Some people maybe never thought of it before until they saw it on, you know, show and they're like yeah. why is this guy and it was also a shock value for the show right this guy is, mm -hmm. looks different than everybody else so we still see them the same way as we would in the 1920s right and there's so many like pop culture implications of it too like i think specifically of like the phantom of the opera and how mm. his scarring kind of turns him in some interpretations turns him into the villain and how we view people with this kind of facial scarring right the other Mm -hmm. that yeah that's amazing and and uh i really love how your research goes into masculinity and thoughts of masculinity and the idea of being a quote whole man yeah you're, you're back to some sense of normalcy and that's why yeah. i think the shelley's question about did the men remove the mask each night uh is a question that you know i never even considered and right. um, I guess, it, as you say, it'd be different for each person. Would they be secure enough with doing that? Or would they just wish to keep it on because that's how they're secure? Yeah, and that's how they want to see themselves too. I mean, we talk about even like in modern times, you know, you can consider this portrait mask a form of body modification. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. What kind of body modifications do we take off? Be like, I take my earrings off and, you know, I change into comfier clothes. And did these men really feel like they had the option to ever really relax and ever really kind of lean into their experiences? Mm -hmm. And masks and surgeries help or hinder that. That's right. The thesis debatable. <laughs> right. Uh, one last question that just popped up that I think is sure. really, really important from Richard Houston. Did you find any evidence of the influence of these survivors' fates impacting the peace movement between the wars? I know there's that famous photo of the guy who said, I lost my sight for yeah. the country or I lost my sight for you or something, and he's he's out on the street asking for money. Yeah, That's so there's actually a couple ways and across kind of that good guy, bad guy divide too. Um, my research mostly focuses on Britain and France, but there are examples of this in Germany and Austria and, and in the Axis powers as well. So yes, there was a group of men in France, I forget the name of their organization off the top of my head, who like who leaned into being mutilated soldiers. They refused to cover up, they refused to wear their masks, they um or if they had masks, they refused to wear them. They really wanted people to see the consequences of war written all over their face. Right. Uh, literally make sure that people couldn't hide from this very impactful consequence of war. And mm -hmm. there was a whole, um, right on the onset of the Weimar Republic, there was a whole um, anti-war pamphlet published that featured uh, disabled, mutilated, and dismembered soldiers exclusively to highlight the consequences of war. And um, it some of the faces that are highlighted in that pamphlet are just horrific. And, and yeah, so 
these men and often their families were really generally um, proponents of peace and, and, and not going to war and, and showing a consequence of war during the interwar years. But there's also evidence of soldiers with facial mutilation who were very patriotic and really um, connected to that nationalistic ma message of World War I, the interwar years and World War II and said, you know, I lost part of my face, I'd lose it again. You guys are you know, kind of the opposite. Like I was masculine enough in the last war to lose my face. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And still, we still hear some of that even today. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. a timeless thing again in history. Right. I did I, why can't you do it as well? Or why don't you mm -hmm. take the chance because I did this for this nation or right. my family or whoever it may be. Yeah. It's really right. Nice. And it's, super interesting to bring this research forward into today and think about how we're still kind of dealing with this intersection of art and medicine. Facial mutilization is a, a trauma that happens consistently, even in these wars that we're fighting in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Basic soldier's uniform has not really changed all that much since World War I. You still have that steel helmet and the face is still exposed to um, trauma, mm -hmm. but the roadside bombs or other things. And there's a lot of facial mutilization that comes out of the Middle Eastern wars as well. But now, instead of tubed pedicles and, and portrait masks, we're 3D printing soft tissue and bone structure to help fill out and kind of present that identity and, and recreate identity again for modern soldiers. Mm, I see. That's awesome, Megan. I really appreciate your time. And I hope that before maybe the end of the weekend or or next few days, you'll go back through some of the comments because yeah. there are some late coming questions that we're not going to have a lot of time to get to. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people really interested in this subject, especially when it pertains to historical memory and what these <laughs> men did with these objects is, is just yeah. really fascinating. And uh, so we'll do our best over the weekend to make sure all your comments and questions are liked or or answered or whatever that may be it's very important that we Absolutely. Shout to all of you but megan thank you so much for your time i know we ran a little bit over i hope you didn't have any sorry no I'm, I'm good like i said uh, <laughs> I'm, good. Uh, I'm sorry i went over but i just no 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 it was me i'm asking about about. Questions. <laughs> but, but uh no i really appreciated what you what you said and drawing attention to some of these people who tried to help these men mm -hmm. uh overcome uh, what they had, the trauma that they had experienced and what they had yeah. been through. And I'm glad to see that new ways of memorializing them and the men especially are coming about with the newer uh, generations of historians or history minded people. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. There's been a couple really interesting exhibits in England and France with the uh, commemoration of the centennial of mm -hmm. the war, both the beginning and the end, where these men are starting to come into the light and the people who help them are starting to come more into the forefront of the social and cultural histories of the war. So if anyone has any questions about that, I have sources. I have so many sources. <laughs> you have so many sources. I, <laughs> I, I pinned Megan's website in the comment section. So as soon as you go into the comment section, it'll be the first thing you see. So Megan, you might get inundated with stuff there too. Uh, <laughs> but we'll make sure that we get to your questions and comments as, as mm -hmm. the next 24, 48 hours happens. Uh, I'm going to be tired after this day, so I don't know when I'll get to uh, it. <laughs> Megan might, might be joining in and helping out. So Megan, thank you so much again for this awesome presentation. It really means a lot to me and it means a lot to those watching. All right, thank you so much. And thank you all for your wonderful questions. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, John. You're welcome. Take care everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.